Right. Titus chapter 2. Um, tonight I, I want to continue with uh, sort of kind of the theme that we started with, with this morning as uh, we looked at Matthew chapter 16 and began to answer the question, why church? And tonight I'm going to stay in kind of the same vein of thought as we look at the pastor's calling, the pastor's calling. Titus chapter 2, and look at with me at verse 15. The Bible says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise them. Let's go to the Lord. As we bow before you tonight, we ask that you would bless this service, bless your word once again. Lord, please give us understanding. Help us to appreciate your wisdom and what you have established for us in the local church and the people that you have put in place in the local church for our good and for our growth and ultimately for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 says, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. To be called of God to pastor is a gift. And I don't say that to be self-serving or to boast in any way because... I will be as honest as I can. It does not fill me with pride. It humbles me to think that God has put me into the ministry. I would imagine that if I were to ask Brother Riffle to testify about it, he would say the same thing. And any man who has a biblical mindset would not take the call to ministry as something to lord over others, but rather would realize how unworthy we are to that calling. But like the Apostle Paul said in Romans eleven thirteen, I magnify my office. That is to say that the office of the pastor is something that God in His wisdom has established and it is good for us. God has ordained that pastors play a crucial role in the lives of God's children in this age. You can look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, and see there that among the gifts that God has given to the church are certain men who are called to certain offices, uh, such as the pastor. And it is for our edification. And one thing is true of everyone in here tonight. Either you are a pastor or you need a pastor, but both is true. And by the way, Pastors need pastors too. But that's another message. So why would I take the time to preach on this topic tonight if not to be self-serving? It's because I truly believe that God's Word is full of so many truths that we need and this is one particular truth that we cannot afford to overlook. If I'm going to be faithful to preach the whole counsel of God's Word, then it would include what God has to say about what I'm doing even here tonight. Part of the reason that I want to teach this and preach this is for my own accountability. I want you as a church to know what I'm supposed to be doing so that if I'm not doing it, you can bring that to my attention and help me do what God has called me to do. Now, as we look in the New Testament especially, what God has to say about the role and the function of the New Testament church pastor, there are many passages that we could go to that are very instructive, but I believe that this verse that we've begun with tonight, Titus 2.15, is one that really summarizes the pastor's calling very well. Now, Paul was writing to a young man by the name of Titus, and he was a young ministry leader, one of Paul's preacher boys. One thing I love about the life of the Apostle Paul is he was always investing in other people, especially young men. We know of some of them by name, 
Uh, of course, Timothy comes to mind. Titus is another one. We know that Silas traveled with him for some time. Uh, we know of others that are named in some of the letters. We know of John Mark, who kind of had a, a little bit of a, a rough spell there. And for that reason, he had left. And, and Paul said, I don't want him to go with us anymore. And, and there was this big uh, falling out between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. And Barnabas took John Mark at that time and Paul took Silas. And, but it's neat that later on, Paul would write back and he would say, send John Mark to me because he is profitable to me for the ministry. And so there were all these men that, that Paul had invested in. Some of them he wrote to and, and that was write, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and preserved for us today in the Word of God. Such was Titus, a young man who had been uh, left on an island in the Mediterranean, the island of Crete, instructed by the Apostle Paul to set in order the things that were wanting. And if you look at chapter 1, part of that was he was to uh, appoint or help the church, I should say, uh, appoint and elect pastors for their congregations. And so there's given a list of qualifications for the pastor in Titus chapter 1. There's also instructions about how to deal with false teachers and, and uh, how to handle those situations. But then we come into chapter 2 of Titus, and Paul begins to give Titus instructions to pass on to the various groups in the churches. And so he talks about instructions for the older men and instructions for the older women, instructions for the younger women, instructions for the younger men, and then some personal instructions to Titus himself as a ministry leader in the local churches, some things that he needed to do. And we get down to verse number 15, and this is really kind of a recap and a summary of what was expected of Titus as a ministry leader. He said, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. And from this verse and other passages in the New Testament, we get, we can glean five specific responsibilities of the local church pastor. Now, this is not a all inclusive list, but this is a very good starting point and summary. The pastor's calling includes the following, preaching the word, exhorting the believers, rebuking those who err, lead people with authority, and exemplify Christ-likeness. Now that's the pastor's calling. And let me be quick to say that no pastor will ever do this perfectly. You know why? Because pastors are people too. Still in the process of sanctification just like everyone else. But the good thing is a pastor doesn't need to be perfect for a Christian to benefit from his ministry. And furthermore, the imperfections should remind others to pray for the pastor as he seeks to fulfill his calling. And really the point of the message tonight is for all of us to understand that the pastor and the people need to be working together to fulfill their callings. And when that happens, both are edified and the body of Christ is built up and God is glorified through them all. Notice with me the first part of the pastor's calling, which is preaching the word. In our text verse, Paul simply told Titus, these things speak. Now, the, these things was talking about the various instructions that were to be given to the different groups of people. Also, going back to chapter 1, how to handle false prophets, how to, uh, um, um, how to choose godly leaders. All of these things, Paul commands Titus, you communicate that to others. These things speak. And when it comes to the pastor's job, preaching and teaching the Bible is the primary task of the pastor. 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul told Timothy there, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. In Acts chapter 6, the apostles uh, had the church elect deacons so that the apostles could give themselves continually to the ministry of the word and to prayer. In 1 Peter 5 and verse number 2, uh, Peter tells the pastors of the churches to feed the flock of God, to, to give them the nutrition of God's Word. 
Same thing is said in Acts 20 and verse 28. And on and on we could go through the New Testament looking at all these passages that talk about how the pastor is supposed to get up and preach and teach the Bible to God's people. And really this is the most visible aspect of a pastor's ministry, is standing up and preaching and teaching the Bible on a regular basis. To some people, that's all that a pastor does. All he does is stand up and uh, he preaches for a little bit and then he goes off and does who knows what, you know. He works about, you know, two hours and 15 minutes a week and has the other time off. Actually, there's a lot more to pastoring than that. And even when it comes to preaching, there's a lot more to it than just the actual standing up and delivering the message. Most pastors, at least if they're doing their job properly, will be spending a lot of time during the week preparing to preach and teach. I said, if they're doing their job right. I I suppose there are some who will just go online and download a sermon somewhere and, you know, read it off, but that's not the right way to do it. Because as pastors, we are also commanded, study to show thyself approved unto God. And so a lot of what a pastor does is going to revolve around the preaching and teaching of the Bible. And ultimately, this ministry of preaching the Word should be the priority because that is the one part of the ministry that will make the biggest impact. God has promised that His Word will not return void. And so the pastor, while he may strive to illustrate the truths as best as he can, he might incorporate stories to try and drive the point home or even use humor sometimes to try and connect the message with the congregation, even if they don't always get his jokes. He still tries with all those other things, but ultimately it's not any of that that is going to benefit any of us. It is the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 28 says in verse 10, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The Word of God is what we need to feed us, to grow us, and to change us into Christ-likeness. Now why should the pastor preach and teach the Bible? Well, I think there are two primary reasons. First of all, it's for the salvation of souls. Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Among other things, that means seek to reach people with the gospel. And how are people going to be saved? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing how? By the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. It is still God's ordained means for people to hear the gospel from the mouth of someone else, for it to be proclaimed to them by Christ's disciples. That's the way that God has ordained that the gospel be spread. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world in wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But there's another uh, purpose of preaching. It's not only for evangelization. It's also for the edification of believers. When Jesus gave the Great Commission to His disciples... He said to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Part of the Great Commission is to teach people to obey the Word of God. And so as a pastor gets up and proclaims the truth of Scripture and teaches people the truth of God's Word and how they need to live by it, he is participating in that Great Commission. It's God's plan for believers to be continually discipled by sitting under the preaching and teaching of the Bible. Again, Ephesians chapter 4 says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When it says perfecting of the saints, it doesn't mean make them flawless. It means for the maturing, the growth of the saints toward maturity. And so the purpose of preaching is twofold. It's not just to see people saved, but also to see the saved grow in sanctification and in Christ-likeness. So yes, one of the primary responsibilities of a pastor is to preach the Word of God. But there are other responsibilities. 
Number two, notice with me the second part of the calling from Titus chapter 2 verse 15 is the encouraging of the believers. He said, these things speak and exhort. I love the biblical word exhort. It's used in many places in different contexts. In fact, it's a name used of the Holy Spirit, sometimes translated as comforter. But the word itself literally means to come alongside someone to assist them. Literally, to call to one side and assist someone in something. That's the word exhort here. It's the idea of maybe somebody has fallen down into a ditch and you get down in there with them to help them out. And that is part of the pastor's job is to encourage and exhort the believers. A pastor who sets himself up on some plane above the congregation is not doing the job biblically. He is proud and he is arrogant. And he's not obeying the instructions that God has given in His Word for the pastors. Pastors must connect with people, build relationships with people so that they can come alongside them and help them in their times of need. How does this happen practically? Let me give you three ways a pastor encourages believers. Number one, and this ties back into his first uh, responsibility, is encouraging through the preaching of the Word of God. Because the pastor's main responsibility is the public preaching and teaching of the Bible, a lot of his other responsibilities are going to be fulfilled in part, at least, through that aspect of the ministry. And so again, when he stands up and he preaches and teaches God's Word, he ought to do so with a goal of encouraging God's people to do what God has said. Again, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You can encourage people with the doctrine, with the teaching of the word of God. But not only does he encourage through the preaching, he also can encourage and should encourage through personal contact. There are some pastors who sequester themselves in their office all week long and they never reach out between service times. They're just buried in their office underneath their books. And they excuse it by saying, well, I'm studying, I'm preparing, I'm giving myself to the ministry of the Word. I do not believe that that's how God intended the ministry of a pastor to be carried out. I believe a pastor must go beyond the pulpit if he's going to have the most effective ministry because people need encouragement through personal care and connection. As a truth, I, I don't know who stated it this way to begin with. I've heard it many times in many places. But truth is best communicated through relationship. Truth is best communicated through relationship. And so pastors must build relationships with people in order to most effectively communicate God's Word to them. Again, this, ex, this idea of exhorting. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, But exhort one another... Do you know what the next word is? Exhort one another on Sundays. Exhort one another Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. No, Hebrews 3.13 says exhort one another daily. Daily. Every single one of us needed encouragement every single day this week. Now the pastor can't be there with everyone every moment of every day to encourage them, but he ought to strive to encourage constantly. <laughs> Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know about you, but I find myself needing more encouragement now than I did previously. Maybe you feel the same way. We need to be exhorted more and more as we see the day approaching. So there's encouraging through preaching, encouraging through personal contact. But then number three, and I believe this is a very important ministry of a pastor, and that is encouraging through prayer. Encouraging through prayer. Acts 6, 4, remember the apostles said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. What were they praying about? Well, we could speculate, but we don't have to because we actually have in Paul's writings some pretty specific prayer lists that he recorded in sharing with the believers what he was praying for. And you know what you find was a common thread in Paul's prayer? The believers. He said, I'm praying for you. 
I'm praying you'll be filled with wisdom. I'm praying you'll be strengthened. I'm praying that, that God, that you will grow. And he was praying for the people. You look at Romans 1, 9, Ephesians 1, 15 through 17, Philippians 1, 4, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 9, and other passages where Paul says, I am praying for you. As a pastor, I cannot be with everyone all the time, but my prayers can go with you. As a pastor prays, of course, he should pray for himself that God would give wisdom and guidance and humility and compassion on those and other spiritual needs, but he should also pray for others. I'm so glad that God did not call me to solve every single problem that might come up in anyone's life at any given time. I'm glad God didn't call me to do that. You know why? Because I couldn't do it. Now, I hope that God would use me to guide people through the Word of God and making good decisions and addressing problems, but ultimately, I can't be there for everyone all the time, but you know who can be? God. And I can pray, and the pastor should pray to God for the people regularly. So the pastor's calling includes exhorting or encouraging the believers. Then number three, Paul said in Titus 2.15, speak, exhort, and he said rebuke. Here's the third part of the pastor's calling, and that is rebuking those in error. At times... Those whom a pastor has a responsibility to shepherd will go astray. And at those times, a pastor must take the appropriate steps to restore them. What does that look like? 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. 2 Timothy 2 also gives an outline. Um, we'll get there in a moment. But how it, God says that a pastor is supposed to deal with people who, who are in error. An unwillingness to deal with sin problems causes the, the hurt to multiply. The only thing that you get by sweeping stuff under a rug is a big pile of dirt. God expects pastors to patiently deal with problems in a Christ-like manner. First of all, let me say it must be done with humility. A pastor must never approach a sin problem with an arrogant spirit. He must humbly address the issue and the people involved. Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken with a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. It must be done, number two, with patience. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you would. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verse 24. These are some verses that God has used in my life and ministry many, many times to help me It says, verse 24 of 2 Timothy 2, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Ignoring a problem is sin but so is dealing with it impatiently. Sin must be dealt with in patience, seeking to restore those who are at fault. This is something that for me, I have to remind myself of. Sometimes as a pastor, you see people doing things and making decisions, and, it, and you've had a similar experience in your life, I'm sure. Somebody's doing something, and you can see this is not good. This is a bad decision, but they're not listening and they're going to do it anyway. And it's like watching a slow motion train wreck. You know what I mean? You're watching the disaster unfold, helpless to do anything about it. Sometimes our flesh jumps in and gets irritated and gets aggravated. And we just want to lash out. Paul says, no, the servant of the Lord must not strive. We're not here to fight about it. We're not here to argue about it. 
We're supposed to be gentle to all men, to be patient with them, and in meekness instruct them. Not chew them out, not rake them over the coals, not call them on the carpet. Instruct them so that hopefully they will repent and acknowledge the truth and recover from the trap of the devil. A pastor must meekly and patiently teach the erring one the truth, praying for repentance. And number three, it must be done with compassion. The purpose of rebuking is ultimately purification in the believer's life. It's not so that the pastor can prove he was right. Oh no, that's, that's not the right reason. It's so that that person can see the truth and they can repent and once again enjoy unhindered fellowship with God. To have the peaceable fruit of righteousness, as Hebrews 12, 11 talks about. And so a pastor must truly have compassion on people. I heard something the other day, the other week, that really stuck with me. Uh, it was uh, Somebody was talking about uh, the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a podcast I was listening to, and the person speaking was talking about in the Gospels where it said that Jesus looked on the multitude and He had compassion on them. And he pointed out something I'd never really thought of before, is that Jesus had compassion on them, even though he knew them perfectly. And that meant he knew all of their faults, all of their sins, all of their problems, all of their ugliness, and yet he had compassion anyway. That really stuck with me. Because as Jesus looked out at that crowd of people, I guarantee you in a crowd of thousands of people like that, there's probably someone in that crowd who just that morning had stolen something from a shop in town. And yet Jesus had compassion on them. There was probably a man in that crowd involved with a woman in a way that he shouldn't have been. And Jesus knew about it. And you know what? He had compassion anyway. There was probably someone there that had said an unkind word to their spouse and really hurt them just the night before, and Jesus knew it, and yet He had compassion on them. Sometimes we are stingy with our compassion. I'm glad the Lord Jesus Christ was not. Even though He knows us in all of our faults, He had compassion, and in the same way, we need to have compassion on one another and A pastor especially must have compassion on those that the Lord gives him to lead. Yes, the pastor is charged with rebuking those in error. But the number four, the pastor's calling, includes this. It includes leading with authority. Titus 2.15 includes those words, with all authority. And they really apply to the previous three instructions and they summarize how a pastor is supposed to lead. He's supposed to lead authoritatively. Now, this is an error that kind of tends to extremes. What is the biblical idea of pastoral authority? Well, first of all, we need to understand that any authority that a pastor might have comes from God. Because all authority ultimately comes from God, whether we're talking about in the home, whether we're talking about in society and government, or whether we're talking about in the church, God has established the structure, and that structure determines who has authority. So in the church, God has ordained it that the church be led by men called of God to serve the church. And one of the words used to describe a pastor is an overseer, literally a supervisor. So if you've worked a job and you ever had a supervisor before, your supervisor was in a level of authority above you. That was just the nature of the job. It's not speaking to their worth or their value or even the quality of their character. That's just their position. In the same way, a pastor is appointed by God in order to oversee the ministry of the church, and with that comes a level of authority. But turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. Because the second thing we need to understand about the pastor's authority, is, this, and it's true about all authority, is that authority is based on accountability. Authority is based on accountability. Who is accountable for the decisions made and the actions taken? In any given situation, the answer to that question is the one who should have the authority. Whoever is going to be held accountable should have the authority. 
Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. So this verse is talking about spiritual authority, but notice what the next phrase says, as they that must give account. Who is the spiritual authority going to give account to? Ultimately to God. Because the pastor is accountable to God for how he leads the church, the church is to follow the leadership of the pastor so long as it is not contradicting the Word of God. The verse goes on to say that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is profitable for you. But you know, at this point, some pastors have taken the teaching of Scripture and used it as a club to beat people into submission. A do-what-I-say kind of mentality. That's not biblical leadership. The third thing we need to understand about biblical authority is that biblical authority is servant leadership. Biblical authority is servant leadership. That is the model that Jesus Christ Himself used. A servant leader. He did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. And a pastor should lead by serving, not by being served. Mark chapter 10. Jesus called them, His disciples, to Him, and saith unto them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever will be of, of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. The night before Jesus was crucified, He had that last meal with His disciples. But one thing He did that evening, it's recorded for us in the book of John, is Jesus, in order to illustrate what servant leadership really looked like, got up from the dinner table. The Bible says that He took off His garments and He girded Himself with a towel and He he came back around and He began to wash the feet of the disciples. And He went around to every one of them, washing their stinky, dirty, disgusting feet. Now, I just think feet in general are kind of ick. But especially if you've been wearing sandals walking on dirt roads all day long. They're going to be especially ick. Okay? But yet Jesus took what was usually the job of the lowest servant in the house and He did it Himself for His disciples. Think about that. The greatest in the universe doing the lowest job. And Jesus, when He was done, He said, do you know what I've done to you? You know what I've done for you? I've done this so that you would understand that like I've done to you, like I have stooped to serve you in even this most menial task, you are to serve one another. That is biblical authority. That is biblical leadership. It is servant leadership. And so yes, a pastor's calling includes leading with authority, but not the world's kind of authority, not the world's kind of leadership, Christ's kind of authority and leadership. And number five now, the last aspect of the calling of the pastor we'll see tonight is this. The pastor's calling includes exemplifying Christ's likeness. Exemplifying Christ's likeness. Paul commanded Titus in Titus 2.15, Let no man despise thee. And that word despise means to look down on. To look, you know, kind of like with a scowl, with a disdain in your eye. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul told Timothy the same thing. <clears throat> he said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. In Titus 2, verse 7, he told Titus, be a, be a pattern of good works. 
So here's the connection and thought. He said, Titus, don't let anyone look down on you. Well, how am I supposed to stop other people from looking down on me? How am I to control their perspective and their view of me? Here's how. By being a pattern, by being an example of a Christian. And what that means is living a Christ-like life. The word pattern and the word example is literally the word we get our English word type from. And it has, it has the idea of, of to create a, a, a mold or a pattern that can be copied over and over and over and over and over again and you get the same results. You get the image that you want to see. Can I say it this way? A pastor ought to be a model Christian. Again, not perfect, but he ought to be striving to exemplify Christ in all that he does. Why? Because there are people following his example. And as Paul told the Corinthians, be you followers of me, even as I am also of Christ, the pastor has a responsibility of leading people into Christ's likeness. It's like playing the game follow the leader when you were kids. Now in that game it was a little different because if you were playing follow the leader, uh, your goal was to try and trip everybody else up. Or at least it was my goal. I was that kid, right? You know. So I'm going around the playground and I'm going up the slide and I'm going down the wrong way and I'm going, I'm going everywhere because I'm trying to throw everybody off. Well, it's kind of like that, but different. Because the job of the pastor is not to throw everybody else off. The job of the pastor is to lead everybody else so that if they're following him, they're also following Christ. Because the pastor's following Christ, you see. It's interesting, though, that Paul did not ask Corinthian believers to follow him for his own glory. But as he was following God, he encouraged them to follow him so that they too would be following God. There was a problem, I say, for many years in churches like ours. It still exists today, but I think it was in some ways more pronounced in previous generations. A very man-centered philosophy of ministry. Large ministries that were built on dynamic personalities. And by and large, what you see in ministries like that is when that ministry leader dies or falls from glory, whatever the case may be, what happens to the ministry? It falls apart. Why? Because it was built on a man. I was reading a book this week and the author was of that philosophy. He made a statement that just, it almost turned my stomach. About how in his point of view, these were his exact words, God doesn't bless a ministry, God blesses a man. Listen, does God bless men? Absolutely. Does the pastor affect God's blessing upon a ministry? Absolutely. But guess what? I'm only one part. I'm only one part. And God's blessing is dependent on all of us following the Lord, not just one man. And so, yes, the pastor is to exemplify Christ's likeness. He is to lead people, but not so that they're following him, not so that he can make a big name for himself, not so that he can get on the platform of some national conference and, and, and boast about it, not so that he can have his name printed in the periodicals, not so that he can be famous, but so that the Lord Jesus Christ can be glorified. As John said, he must increase. I must decrease. Now I've said this a couple of times and I will say it again. No pastor will ever do the job perfectly because no pastor is perfect. But each pastor should strive to fulfill their calling, relying on God's grace to enable them to do what is beyond the strength of the flesh. But knowing all the while that they're growing and they're changing, and they're becoming more like Christ, just like every other Christian should be. And hopefully, each will be a better pastor tomorrow than they are today. There are times where I have prayed, Lord, give this church a better pastor, and let it be me. 
Lord, help me to grow. Help me to change. Give me more wisdom. Give me more understanding. Help me to yield to the Holy Spirit more. Help me to be more like Christ. Because I will admit to you, I haven't arrived yet. And if you've been around any length of time, you've probably picked up on that. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing that you do not have, have to have a perfect pastor then to benefit from the ministry of a pastor. If there are people out there looking for the perfect church and the perfect pastor, they're not going to find it. God factors in the failures of the men He calls when He calls them, and He uses them anyway. God picks a man and says, you know what? I want you to be a pastor in a local church. And guess what? I already know you're going to mess up. But that's okay. I'm going to use you anyway. And not to burst anyone's bubble, but can I just gently remind us all, you're not perfect either. But helping us all work together toward that sanctification in Christ is one of the reasons that God has put us together. That's one of the reasons God has established the church is so that we can be edified. As pastor and people work together, all are edified and God is glorified. What's the takeaway from a message like this? Well, first of all, it's the truth of Scripture that I hope will help you tonight to understand what God wants to do in your life through the ministry of Philadelphia Baptist Church. That part of that is giving you pastors and teachers who are charged with certain things for your benefit. But I must say that I also hope that from this message tonight that you would pray for me, that you would pray for Brother Riffle, that you would pray for others in leadership in our church as, that, as we seek to fulfill God's calling on our lives. Lord willing, in the weeks ahead, I'm, I'm going to talk about the calling of the deacons. What's that all about? I'm, I'm going to touch on the calling of the teachers, like Sunday school teachers. What, what's their calling? What are they supposed to be doing? Because in the body of Christ, there are many members, and all of those members have different functions. And understanding how we're supposed to be working together is crucial. If we're going to function as God wants us to. And also, if we're going to pray for one another as we should. So let me encourage you tonight. God knew what He was doing when He established the church. God knew what He was doing when He set up the structure and appointed certain offices like pastor and deacon. This is God's plan. You cannot improve upon it. Let's praise God tonight for His wonderful wisdom and what He's done for us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the blessing that it is to be a part of Your program in this age, a part of the local church. And Lord, You know my heart. I, I hope that nothing I've said has gotten in the way of the truth of Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would Help all of us to appreciate your wisdom and really the grace that you have shown us in giving us the church. And Lord, I pray that each of us would be faithful to do our part. I know that Almost everyone else in here has not been called to the office of the pastor. But Lord, may the truth of this message still help them to receive the full benefit from your plan. And I pray these things in Jesus' name.